Okay, great. Uh, well, first, thank you to everyone for joining us tonight. My name is Elena Nunez. I'm the Executive Director of Colorado Common Cause. Uh, for those of you who don't know us, Common Cause is a nonpartisan organization that's dedicated to upholding the core values of American democracy. So we work to create open, honest, and accountable government that serves the public interest, to promote equal rights, opportunity, and representation for all, and to empower people to make their voices heard as equals in the political process. So thank you all for being with us tonight. Thank you to Rock the Vote and Public Citizen and all of our other partners at Secure Our Vote who made this uh, webinar happen. I uh, definitely want to give a shout out to all of the activists with Common Cause as well as Public Citizens Democracy Leaders Program for joining us tonight. We hope this is informative and will uh, help to uh, inspire your work in your states. Um, I'm just going to take a couple of minutes to do a broad overview about election administration work and then hand it over to our panelists because we have a great uh, set of folks tonight with experiences at um, all different levels of government as well as, as advocates uh, to really inform how to think about uh, voting integrity and uh, election administration. So when we think about election administration at Common Cause, we really think about how are decisions made that will impact people's lives and their ability to cast ballots. And our voting and elections program is rooted in the belief that everyone who's eligible to vote should be able to do so without barriers, that it should be convenient for everyone to cast a ballot. And the second piece of that is that we should all have confidence that our votes are being counted accurately. And so those two pieces really form the core of our voting and elections program and what we're gonna dig into a little bit tonight. So on the elections administration piece, a lot of this has to do with how are the laws and policies that are adopted often at the federal level, sometimes at the state level, how are they actually put into practice on the ground? And I think when we think about voting rights, we often think about the Voting Rights Act or laws that are passed in state capitals that say whether or not someone can register to vote on election day or how they're able to cast a ballot. But in practice, a lot of the experiences that voters have are rooted in election administration, which are the policies and decisions that a local election official will make throughout the year that will impact what a voter's experience looks like. And those can be pretty significant. Everything from how are voting locations chosen? And one thing that we're working on here in Colorado right now is uh, the choice to put a voting location on a college campus. And where you put that on the college campus makes a difference of whether or not students are able to access the ballot conveniently. So that's something that isn't necessarily written into statute, but it's an election administration choice that based on how it's made has the impact to either empower people to cast ballots or could create problems. On the voting integrity side, when we think about security of elections, the same thing happens. Again, some of these principles are put into place in terms of requirements at the state level, but there are also decisions that election officials will make that will have a difference on the integrity of the election. What type of voting systems are selected? Are they, so, are they systems that rely on paper? If they're paper ballots that are counted by a machine, what sorts of processes are put into place to guarantee that those paper ballots are being counted accurately? And we have some great panelists who will talk more about the nuts and bolts of those pieces, but it all comes down again to this idea that there are a lot of decisions that get made locally and working with election officials is a great way to make sure that they're made in a way that's pro-voter. And I think that, you know, before I pass it off to our panelists, I'd say that's the one thing, if I could convey anything, it's that the decisions that get made around elections are a real opportunity for us to partner with local election officials. We often have shared experiences because at the same time that we're talking to voters because we're trying to get them out to vote or helping them with problems, election officials are doing the same thing. And if we're able to work together on solutions, we're often most well equipped to come up with policies that provide better security for our elections as well as better access. And we have some great panelists who will help us dig into that. And I want to take just a few minutes to introduce them all and then hand it off and have each of them uh, go through their presentations. So our first speaker tonight will be Tom Hicks, who uh, is a member of the Election Assistance Commission. Uh, he is a commissioner. He was appointed to the EAC by President Obama in 2014. Prior to that, Tom served in the U.S. House of Representatives Committee on House Administration, where he oversaw issues of campaign finance, election reform, and um, as well as overseeing the EAC and FEC. And prior to that, he actually was with Common Cause as our senior lobbyist and policy analyst. 
Our next speaker will be Amber McReynolds, who's the Director of Elections for the City and County of Denver. She's administered elections for over 12 years and worked in public policy and administration for more than 16 years. Under her leadership, the Denver Elections Division has earned national as well as international awards from the Election Center, the National Association of Counties, and the International Center for Parliamentary Studies for Ballot Trace, which is a first in the nation program that allows voters to track their ballot, their mail ballot throughout the ballot process. Uh, we also at Common Cause had the honor to partner with Amber in moving our elections modernization law back in 2013 and continue to work together. Our next speaker will be Barbara Simons. Barbara Simons is uh, with Verified Voting, and she's the former president of the Association for Computing Machinery, the nation's largest educational and scientific computing society. And she's the only woman to have received the Distinguished Engineering Alumni Award from the College of Engineering of UC Berkeley, where she earned her PhD in computer science. She's also an expert on electronic voting and published the book, Broken Ballots, Will Your Vote Count? And then our final speaker is Hannah Free, who's with Access Democracy. She's been working on voting issues since 2004, taking calls on voter information hotlines, as well as directing voter protection efforts for the DNC between 2009 and 2012, the Obama campaign in 2012, and the Clinton campaign in 2016. And in addition to her voter protection work, Hannah spent several years in federal government service at the Department of Justice and the EPA. So we have a great lineup, and I want to uh, get us right into that. Our first speaker will be Tom Hicks. And Tom, you'll need to sh go ahead and share your screen. There. Can everyone hear me now? Okay, great. Uh, technology is not my strong suit, but elections are. So I'm Tom Hicks, and I am with the U.S. Election Assistance Commission. I want to thank you uh, for introducing me, and um, I want to thank Common Cause and Rock the Vote for allowing me to be a part of this um, webinar tonight. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about who the EAC is, what we do, and um, how activists should become more involved in the process. With so that. what is the EAC? Glad you asked. EAC stands for Election Assistance Commission. And simply put, our goal is to make your job easier. No, seriously. We were established by the Help America Vote Act of 2002 as an independent bipartisan commission charged with helping Americans vote. The primary way we do that? By ensuring election officials have the support and resources they need. We help in a few ways. We craft and adopt the voluntary voting system guidelines, accredit test laboratories, and certify voting systems serve as the nation's clearinghouse of information and best practices related to elections. We also maintain the National Mail Voter Registration Form, which can be used to register to vote, update registration information with a new name or address, or register with a political party, and develop recommendations and standards that address the needs of voters, state and local election leaders, and other election stakeholders. At the end of the day, we work to ensure every eligible American has the opportunities to vote independently, privately, and with confidence in our nation's election system. We do everything in our power to make sure election officials have what they need to support that. Learn more at EAC.gov. So you are the first folks to see this video. Um, on Sunday, we will celebrate 15 years since President Bush signed the Help America Vote Act into existence, creating the uh, U.S. Election Assistance Commission. We're a bipartisan commission, uh, two from each political party. I'm the only Democrat right now, and um, hopefully uh, there will be a fourth sometime in the near future. We're presidential appointees appointed by the um, approved by the U.S. Senate, um, and we took office in January of 2015. Um, why is election administration um, important? It's a decentralized system run by the states. There's more than 50 election, assist, uh, election administration systems. 
It's not uniform. So each state and jurisdiction to jurisdiction may have different uh, aspects of it. And there's over 8,000 jurisdictions. That being said, this is why you should become more involved. I, have, I equate election administration to roads and voting being the car. So if you have a good car, you want to run it on a good road. You don't want to run it on a bumpy, pay unpaved, um, crazy road because your car will become damaged. We want democracy in the United States to remain strong and vibrant. Therefore, we want to make sure that that road is done well. And therefore, election administration should be done well as, as well. And that's one of the things that EAC has done. One of the things that we are constantly confused with is the Federal Elections Commission. The Federal Elections Commission deals with campaign behavior and campaign finance. The Election Administration, the Election Assistance Commission deals with everything else from um, polling places to um, um, compute from voting machines to standards to um, registration to counting of the ballots, A through Z. Um, we just published our new EVE survey, which I'll talk about a little bit later. We are the go-to resource for our clearinghouse and election de um, data administration, best practices and information. We administer the National Voter Registration Form, and we currently, in this last election cycle, took up more of a role, including cyber and physical security resources, working with Department of Homeland Security uh, in, that, in that role. We recently formed the uh, Council of uh, Governments, uh, Council, the G Government Council for um, Elections, which will be run by DHS, but we will be a, play a leading role in um, with election officials. As I said, we've done um, our election administration and voting survey, which deals is the most comprehensive survey in the in nation on voting topics. We recently put together a state-by-state -state compendium on all election laws in those states, which both can be found on our website. Um, another informational piece that we always have is know your voting rights. So those folks who have disabilities, if you look on the right here, um, there's a small card that, is, uh, that we've given out to thousands of individuals on what their rights are as uh, disabled voters, basically things like you can vote independently and privately have someone come in and help you if you should need that. Uh, we also have done a um, election phrase translation on several different languages. I think it's about seven or eight. And then we have a um, poll worker um, election manual as well. We're also running a contest on best practices for innovative ideas and other aspects like that that's now closed and we have five folks who are judging that. So with that, I want to leave enough time for questions um, in the limited amount of time that we have, but also to encourage you because as we go into election cycles, every Tuesday there is an election in some state. And that being said, we need poll workers. We need individuals to um, you know, make sure that things are going right. So we want to make sure that um, we have enough folks who are becoming involved in the election administration process. Uh, briefly, my time at Common Cause was spent not only as senior lobbyist, but Common Cause gave me the opportunity to serve as a poll worker. As a poll worker, I became a, a chief election official for my precinct, which meant that I was in charge of that precinct, opening and closing of the polls, making sure that those voting machines were okay. And so I always say, look from the inside on seeing how the election administration process is being done. So I think that that propelled me to work on the Committee on House Administration as a um, person who oversaw uh, several laws re re revolving around elections to being appointed by President Obama for this commission. So that being said, this is my contact information. Um, I just recently wrote a blog that came out today on our website at eac.gov talking about security of elections as well. So um, follow me at Red and Blue 2024. Um, EAC has a web, um, YouTube channel, um, Facebook page, and um, other aspects as well. 
So with that, I will uh, stop sharing and turn it over to, I believe, Amber now. Great, and let me, this is Amber, let me get my screen shared here. Okay. Hopefully my screen is showing. Can everybody see that? Yeah, okay. Um, okay, well, Thanks for the opportunity to talk tonight a little bit about what uh, our approach has been in Denver. Um, I sort of like to say that this is mile high election innovation um, is, is sort of the best way that I can describe it. Um, pretty picture of the city in the mountains that you can see on here. But um, one of the things, and in, in I've been here now 12 years, I actually came um, to elections sort of starting in, in the United Kingdom uh, years ago when I was doing my master's at the London School of Economics. And then when I moved back to the States, I actually worked um, for the New Voters Project in Iowa and worked on civic engagement issues for college students and institutionalizing programs at that level. Um, so I sort of started outside of the elections world. And um, one of the reasons that I got so excited about it was was the engagement piece and I think I was able to bring a new way of looking at election administration into um, Denver. Uh, Denver's gone through various changes since I started here 12 years ago um, but when I did get here I, I heard what I heard a lot in the election administration world was we've always done it that, this way so we're going to continue to do it this way or the law says this, so these are why we have all of these sort of extra steps and burdens in the process. And there was really resistance in, in sort of looking at things differently and seeing things differently. Um, so since I've been here, that's honestly been an energy that I've had in this space since uh, beginning in Denver. And our team um, very much values that as well. And so we've really tried to focus on the voter experience, ma making sure that our process is voter centric. We've advocated for changes in the laws to make sure that happens. Elena mentioned earlier, we've partnered with Common Cause and, and really helped lead the effort to modernize elections in Colorado. Um, but our, our main thing is to make sure that we have a meaningful voting experience for all eligible voters and, and it should not be difficult for them to participate. Um, so with that, our values as we approach this, and I, I usually put this up because service is the core of it. Um, and as I mentioned, this, this focus on customer service, voter centric, voter experience related um, processes, but also laws are really important to all of this. Um, elections are about precision, they're about timeliness. Um, one of the things that, you know, as an election administrator, um, I also I have an acronym for this, but I think that we should always be focused on faster elections. And that means that we're conducting fair, accurate, secure, transparent, efficient, and reliable elections. And I think all of those values and, and also the ones that you see on the screen are very much what we have focused on locally in Denver to do all the great things that we've been able to do. Uh, so with that, I did wanna just briefly share kind of the uh, model in Colorado, if you aren't familiar with it. Um, as Elena mentioned, we did do a modernization a few years ago, which included a few key elements that I, I just want to cover briefly. Uh, voter registration modernization. So we eliminated the 30-day precinct residency requirements, which were when we looked at this, and this was very much a data-driven decision and one that I advocated for, um, mainly because sort of just adding same day registration doesn't help voters when you actually look at the reasons they vote provisionals. Um, it is, they vote provisionals often because there's overly restrictive precinct or residency requirements. And so by us doing this, this is one of the main reasons that we've been able to reduce provisional ballots and make sure that votes get counted. Uh, we opted for a 22 day state residency requirement and then we now have registration up to and on election day, which has very much transformed the voting experience in a positive way. Um, provisional ballots, as I mentioned, so this was sort of the reform happened in 2013. This is statewide provisional numbers um, 
2010, 2012, 2014, you can see we went from, you know, over 2% usually casting provisionals to less than 0.4%, less than 1,000 uh, provisionals were cast statewide. Um, in that same 2014 election, we probably should have had about 75,000 or 80,000 had we not made the reforms um, to the process. Um, and then 2016, and this is, this is Denver specific data here, but um, you can see the significant change just in the city and county of Denver, which has a very mobile population, a very young population. Uh, 2012, we had almost 11,000, which was uh, one in 28 voters. And after the reforms, less 340 and one in 1,000 voters. So a significant improvement and one that we want, or that we're very proud of, especially from a voting experience perspective, but also a cost perspective. Um, and then the second piece is proactive list maintenance. Uh, this has done various things. It's uh, made our list more accurate, reduced undeliverable ballots, and created cost savings. So we can ensure, and when we have ballot delivery like we do, we have to be sure that we know where people are, and we built in protections to make sure that we would um, be able to make sure the, the ballots were being mailed to the right address. So that's been a significant piece for us as well. Um, and then ballot delivery, as I mentioned, um, Elena mentioned that we have what we call ballot trace. Um, we actually started that here in Denver, built the app with a local software company back in 2009. And we did so because we actually analyzed our customer service call data in 2008 and found that many, many people were calling us to ask us when were the ballots being mailed? Did, you know, is it on the way to me? Is it with, where is it at in the postal process? Did you get it back again uh, once I sent it in? And so we wanted to create a tool where people could proactively track their mail ballots. And we added that um, transparency to it. And so now it's, a, it's one of the best customer service tools that I believe exists in the election process. And now many states and jurisdictions are also using it. Um, and the other piece, um, this gives you statistics, um, about a third of our voters are now utilizing it. Um, and it also has become, it has impacted their, um, their success rate with their, with their mail ballots as well. Um, so voters enrolled in ballot trace had a 7% higher acceptance rate and, uh, and a 2% higher return rate. Uh, the accepted rate, um, it means that basically they had a success rate of getting their mail ballot counted, meaning that they could get notified sooner with um, ballot cure issues or signature discrepancy issues. Uh, we would see people that would get ballot trace text messages about their mail ballot in our office within an hour of getting the text message to resolve that issue. So it certainly impacts voters in a positive way. And this again is another um, uh, step in our voting experience um, approach. Uh, and then finally, um, I think ballot processing, this just shows a, an image, but we have this on our website. Um, I won't go over it in detail, but we have the steps of the election process on our website. And we try to be really transparent and informative with the voters about what happens with their particular ballot when it comes in. Uh, and then finally, um, the last piece of our model is, is an in-person voting experience. Um, we have voter service and polling centers. Uh, it offers accessible in-person options, voter registration, drop-off, replacement ballots. Um, for us, we also, we have 24-hour boxes across the city. Voters can drop them off, drop their mail up, mail it off at any of those sites. Uh, we also have drive-through drop-off, so you can just drive up and hand your ballot out through the car to an election judge. Um, and last year, interestingly enough, 80% of our voters used either the drive through drop off or the 24 hour box in lieu of the post office. So only 20% of our voters are now mailing it back. And I think we've provided a really good way for voters to get their ballot back to us um, sooner than it would be if it was through the post office, but also gives them an in-person voting experience, even though they're using the ballot that, that we mail to them at home. Um, and then, and let me say one more thing. I don't have it on the slides, but for our uh, in-person voting experience as well, we just rolled out a mobile voting unit, um, that, and it's a trailer, and we'll be able to set it up at events and other venues that we don't have designated as a voting service location across the city. Um, our intent for that is um, more mobility for college campuses, um, also for 
uh, sort of RTD park and ride transit locations, grocery stores. So anywhere we don't normally have a uh, voter service and polling center, we'll be able to utilize that unit now. Um, and then this is just gives you a summary of kind of our breakdown in Denver. And the only thing I want to highlight on here, um, we have very high turnout, obviously, uh, Colorado is very high for the country, but one of the areas that we're still focused on in Denver is the 18 to 24 year olds. 68% um, is very good uh, comparatively nationally, but it's not good enough for us. So we are still focused on ways to engage them, um, bringing in more students to be election judges. We work with partners such as Inspire uh, Colorado to um, try to facilitate voter registration in high schools. And we're trying to also engage um, high schools now with civic engagement activities and taking our mobile voting unit out to educate them on the process. Um, and then finally, one of the other items I wanted to mention um, that, that we have on our list here is um, uh, security, so cybersecurity. Um, Denver actually just, we actually just got recognized for our efforts in some of the cybersecurity partnerships that we've built over time. Um, one of our key city partners is our technology services division. Um, I set up a relationship and partnership with um, that department many years ago, and we have an extensive um, project plan with them on technology, um, but that also includes significant security protocols. And you can see on here just a depiction of all of the different variables, all of the different agencies that are involved in security and monitoring it. And it really does require commitment, collaboration, coordination, and communication across all different sectors and all different levels of government. And I think that we've done a really good job of, of uh, setting up a model that would work for election offices all over. Uh, so with that, hopefully I um, try to cover as much as I could. Uh, there's my information. Our website is on there. I would encourage anyone who hasn't been to our website to visit it. We have a lot of uh, a wealth of information on there. Um, our social media platforms are also great ways to follow what we're doing. We use Periscope and Facebook Live to show all of our ballot processing, our auditing, our canvas, our testing of the election systems, all of those great things. Um, we try to push through social media to add transparency and bring people into our process and make sure that um, they're educated on, on all that we do. Uh, so with that, I'll turn it to the next speaker. I think I'm the next speaker, right? Yes. Okay. Um. Okay, do you see the slideshow? Hello? Not seeing it, but let me try one thing really quick to make it easier for you. Maybe I didn't switch the uh, screen. So at the bottom, you should see um, share screen. Okay, let me go back, hold on. I did click it, but it didn't work. So Okay, and I'm also happy to pull up your two yes. slides that you have if you want. How about that? Does that do it? How about that? Beautiful. All right. Into your screen. Just uh, select your specific slide. Right. So, let's go to slideshow. And disconnect. How's that? Does that work? I'm okay. seeing a dark screen, not a slide. Okay, it worked before, so let me just go. Oh, back. there it is. There it is. Wait. Yep. There it is. Okay. okay. Hold. So before I disconnect it. Okay, very good. Sorry about that, guys. Um, so as the only computer scientist who's speaking, I'm going to have the most boring slides. Um, Hopefully you'll find it interesting. I was asked to speak about um, election, about security of elections. And this is, as you can imagine, a huge topic. So I'm going to have to be, um, 
I'm just going to have to do a very high level description. I should have mentioned in the beginning slide that I am the board chair of verified voting. I'm also on the board of advisors of the Election Assistance Commission. And um, our, our website, Verified Voting's website, is verifiedvoting.org. So why do we have to be worried? Um, here are a couple of quotes. Uh, you've probably seen the quote from former FBI Director James Comey. They'll be back in 2020. They may be back in 2018. And one of the lessons they may draw from this is that we were successful because they introduced chaos and division and discord and so doubt about the nature of this amazing country of ours and our democratic process. What, what Comey was talking about was the Russians. Now, one of, the, uh, one of our concerns uh, and what makes this truly a bipartisan issue is that we have to worry about our elections being hacked by North Korea, Iran, uh, uh, China, Russia, uh, various uh, enemies of the United States. So um, this is uh, a concern, Oof, come on. This is a concern that everybody has to be worried about, both Democrats and Republicans. And I simply included another quote from a Democrat, Senator Mark Warner, who is uh, co-chair of the Senate Intelligence Committee, is very, very concerned about what's gonna be happening in 2018 with the midterms. So how is America voting? We are using computers almost everywhere. Uh, in the polling place, there are two types of systems. They are called direct recording electronic, which are typically touchscreen systems. You've seen pictures uh, where people complain about their vote, not about hitting, about making a mark in one spot on the screen and another lights up. Those are DREs. Um, they may or may not have a paper trail. They're called direct recording electronic because the results are stored in computer memory. Uh, in addition, there are paper ballots, which are marked by the voter, and they are tabulated by optical scans, scan machines uh, that record and tabulate the ballots, and these optical scans have computers in them. That's how they work. And then there's remote voting, which is mail-in ballots or internet voting. Um, Colorado is doing basically pretty much mail-in, well, they're doing remote voting, uh, as, is, or, as are Oregon and Washington. And again, those ballots are going to be tabulated by scanners, which have computers. And uh, as a computer scientist, I have to say computers ain't perfect. All large programs have software bugs. Voting machine software is very large because it has to deal with uh, races in all the states and various counties, and the laws differ enormously, as I'm sure Tom would uh, uh, acknowledge. And this makes voting complicated. I also want to point out that Apple and Microsoft frequently send out software fixes, uh, and that's because nobody can write secure software uh, for a large program. This is just, it's just too complicated. And we have these major vendors sending out periodic bug fixes. Uh, the vendors who make voting machine software typically don't have the kinds of resources that an Apple or a Microsoft can have, and bugs in voting machine software could impact the results of an election. Uh, therefore, computer vulnerabilities put our elections at risk. And I want to emphasize that we may not know that there's a problem for months after the election. For example, the recently discovered Yahoo breach started in 2014. The Democratic National Committee breach was not discovered for six months. The Equifax hack was discovered at least two months after the breach. And as you know, uh, there were 143 million victims. And in fact, less than three weeks ago, Equifax discovered that there was malware on their website. Where, where they were having people go to correct their system, to, to get upgrades and fix their, uh, their privacy, to deal with privacy concerns. And malware had been loaded onto their website by a third party. So there are lots of security threats. Um, so again, the security issues are that we have electronic voting machines. Uh, and despite congressional testimony and comments by others, even if these machines are not connected to the internet, they could still be attacked. Uh, that's because Every election, these machines have to be programmed for every election, and the programming is done on computers, on separate computers that typically are connected to the internet. And the problem is these computers could be infected, and then the infection can be passed on to the voting machine by, mem by, by memory devices that are used to transfer the information from the computers to the voting machines. As an example, you probably remember what happened to the Iranian subterfuges when they all got hacked. Those were not connected to the internet, but they were successfully hacked basically using this technique. Internet voting itself is grossly insecure. 
The other area where I'm very concerned is voter registration databases, but I don't have any slides on that because I don't have time, but we can discuss that in questions if people want. So we now, the current situation in our country is that five states are entirely paperless, as you can see, Delaware, Georgia, Louisiana, New Jersey, and South Carolina. Um, when the, there was this huge race in Georgia, in, in, this, in CD District uh, 6, where $50 million was spent, that race was held entirely on Diebold paperless touchscreen machines that we've known how to hack since 2006. There are still eight states that are partially paperless listed here. That means it is impossible to conduct a meaningful recount in 13 states. Furthermore, even states that have paper ballots typically do not conduct adequate post-election ballot audits. And I have to say that Colorado is going to be a big exception, uh, and hopefully I'll get a chance to talk about that uh, momentarily, but Colorado is, is doing the right thing. So here's an example of why we have to worry about paper versus paperless. Uh, in Carteret County, North Carolina, some years ago, almost 4,500 votes were lost in early voting and uh, 2,287 20, votes separated the agricultural commissioner candidates. Um, there were various attempts made to try to rehold this election. Uh, finally, people sent in affidavits saying they voted for the Republican candidate and a judge ruled on the basis of those affidavits of the Republican one. So this is the only election I know of that was decided by affidavits. That machine, those machines that caused that problem, that machine was the Unilec Patria. It was just decertified in Virginia just a few weeks ago. In Pot Pottawatomie County, Iowa, in the 2006 Republican primary, there were suspicious machine results. Uh, people knew that the wrong people had, wrong candidates had been declared the winner because an 18 year old boy won and he wasn't supposed to win. Fortunately, they had paper ballots. They had to go to court to count them because the recount laws were so bad, but they managed to recount them and they found out who the correct winners were, who were the people they were expecting. It turns out there was a ballot rotation problem and the, pro and the machines just had been incorrectly programmed. So the gold standard, and this is what's going to be implemented in Colorado, is what's called risk-limiting ballot audits. And basically it uses statistics to determine if the correct candidates have been declared the winners by the computers. Now remember, these computers, um, we, we cannot trust the computers. I mean, that's something that every computer scientist will tell you. You can't trust the computers. You need to check on them in something so important as voting. And risk-limiting audits do that. You need paper ballots, and you need to be able to check the paper ballots against the computer. And these can be done very efficiently in most cases and they will typically be far less work than doing a recount. The good news is with risk limiting paper ballots, they provide proof for the losers and the loser supporters. And we, we, one of the things that we, we are all worried about is we wanna make sure that voters ch trust, trust the results and trust, the, trust basically voting, trust going to the, uh, voting on these machines, voting on paper ballots. They can trust voting on paper ballots that are counted by computers, if there are risk limiting audits. And there are, um, Colorado was the very first state to pass a law requiring risk limiting audits. That's gonna be used in the upcoming election. And so, you know, I support uh, the this comments from, from Denver that, that, that things are really, are real, very well done in Colorado. Rhode Island just passed a law also uh, to acquire risk limiting audits. Virginia, um, they actually have a law, they had a law to eliminate paperless DREs by 2020. But as some of you may have heard, there was a, a machine hacking village at DEF CON recently, and they found that, they, that there were problems with every single machine that they looked at there. And as a result of that, Virginia tested all of their paperless machines. They still were using five different kinds of paperless machines, some of which we knew were very insecure. They, the testing was such that um, the three member board of elections accepted the recommendation of the commissioner of elections to, to decertify all of these machines. And this was a bipartisan decision, unanimous, done by the Virginia Board of Elections. And as a result, the upcoming governor's race and the 2018 midterm race in Virginia will be held on all paperless machines. Uh, in New Jersey, by contrast, where there's also an upcoming uh, governor's race this year, the entire race will be held on totally paperless machines again, that are very insecure and it will be impossible to conduct a recount. Georgia, again, as I said, is all paperless. I mentioned the CD6 race where $50 million was spent uh, on a race where you, that was voted on machines we know how to hack. Um, there's a lot of scandal that's going on. In, in fact, there's a breaking news story today about Georgia. 
that you may uh, read if you if you do a Google search, you'll see it, or it might be on the on your local news, where uh, some of the, uh, the the servers that were used in these elections were wiped clean after the election, despite the fact that there was uh, a lawsuit that was submitted. So I will skip this because it's late. Uh, internet voting. I think this slide is self-explanatory. If you look at it, you'll see the thing that all these entities have in common is they have all been successfully hacked. And so you have to ask, how can underfunded, understaffed, under-resourced local election officials, most of whom little, have little to no computing efficiency or computer security expertise, protect their systems in an internet election from well-financed ad adversaries from foreign countries, political operatives, and rogue hackers. So verified voting is involved with the national campaign. We want to replace all of the DREs with voter marked paper ballots in all 50 states. We want to change the laws to require risk limiting audits everywhere. It should not be the responsibility of candidates to ask for audits or recounts because we as citizens have the right to know who the correct winners are. This is fundamental to our democracy and it's a terrible burden to put on candidates. We also want to prohibit all internet voting for, for the foreseeable future. We also have to make voter registration databases as secure as possible. As I say, I, there's no time to talk about that now. Um, if you want to know what kinds of systems are used where you live in your state or in your county, Verified Voting has a map of the country. You can drill down to the state and to the county. It's basically used by everybody who looks at these things. Uh, we also on our website have information about the various types of voting systems, if you're interested in a particular one. And I thought I would just close with this Dilbert ca cartoon. Uh, which hopefully you'll have a minute to read. So uh, I think that's where we are. Hi, this is, this is Hanafi with Access Democracy. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen with everybody. Okay, looks like that worked. Thank you very much um, to everybody for joining and uh, especially to our host at Common Cause and Rock the Vote. I'm really excited to talk with you about some of the work that we're doing in Access Democracy and about uh, how to work effectively with local and state election officials. So let's start first by talking about 2016 and what voters experienced. So, in an election that was decided by 80,000 voters across three states, 16 million Americans encountered a problem voting, ranging from long lines to broken voting equipment to problems with registration. And one million people did not vote because of those problems. That's one million people who wanted to vote but couldn't. And again, in an election that was decided ultimately by just 80,000 people. When polling places are put in locations that are hard to access by public transit or when people of color are six times as likely to wait to vote for more than an hour than white voters or when 30 year old voting machines break down and election officials ask for but are denied the funding that they need to replace them, those are the obstacles that keep Americans from voting. And those are the problems that Access Democracy is taking on. A few things for you all to know about us. First, we are nonpartisan, and that means that we're able to really shine a spotlight on specific problems, regardless of an official's party affiliation or the constituencies that are impacted. We're advocating for all voters' uh, voting rights. The second thing to know is that we're going after low-hanging fruit. We've identified near-term achievable goals that can be addressed quickly and that have a real impact. And the third thing uh, to know is that we are 100% focused on how elections get run, on election administration issues. There's so much great work being done, including by many of the groups that are represented on this call, um, participating on this call, in the courts and in the fight for better laws and to register voters and turn out voters. Our background is in campaign voter protection work, and we're taking the work that we've done in the field for the past decade, um, including during the last two presidential races, and bringing it to the city and county level in our three pilot states. 
And those are Florida, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania. And in all three, together with our local partners, we are working to make it easier for all eligible Americans to access the ballot. And, you know, this work does not get done without local election officials. Um, let me tell you, to give you a sense of what I'm talking about, um, about some of the changes that occurred in Miami-Dade County that were made by the county supervisor of elections between 2012 and 2016, and about the impact that that had on real voters. Um, in 2016, the supervisor of elections, Christina White, added 10 more early vote sites compared to 2012. Uh, she doubled the number of ballot printers. She doubled the number of voter check-in stations at early vote sites. She added privacy booths. Small changes, really about resources, not really about the law. And the impact was that in 2012, voters had to wait six hours in line to vote. And in 2016, they were in line for less than an hour. Significant change. There's a lot that we can learn about um, election administration from what happened in Miami-Dade between 12 and 16. The first lesson I think we can draw is that election administration problems actually are solvable. None of us should be accepting six hour wait times to vote. And there are common sense measures like having enough voting equipment to serve your voters that cut down on voters wait times. The second lesson that I think we can draw is that local election officials have the power to make changes that can radically impact a voter's ability to cast a ballot. In response to the long wait times and other problems that voters experienced in Florida in 2012, that state's legislature uh, expanded early vote opportunities. And there's no doubt that that contributed to the decreased wait times that we saw in 16. But the law left to county supervisors of elections full authority to set the number and days of early vote, the location of their sites, um, the, day, the hours that they would be open, and how to resource these sites. So ultimately, the decision about how to run the election in Miami rests with the supervisor of elections, and that's true in states across the country. A lot of local power. The third thing to bear in mind when you're thinking about election administration and about election officials is that um, they really want to make sure elections are run well. Um, but they don't always have access to the data or the resources to drive the results that we all want, which are well-run elections. But the good news is that these resources really do exist. I, if you are able to look at the slide deck, I've listed a couple of them right here. There is nonpartisan academic research and data being collected um, by poll observers every election cycle that helps us to identify the causes of voting problems. The election management toolkit that I have a link to here produced by Caltech MIT Voting Technology Project predicts line length based on factors like projected turnout, the time it takes to vote a ballot, and the number of voting machines. And the Presidential uh, Commission on Election Administration, uh, which is a bi was a bipartisan entity that came together after 2012, issued a report in 14 with best practices for polling place management and for maintaining accurate and up-to-date voter lists. Uh, you can see that, by the way, on Access Democracy's website if you don't have a copy. Um, resources like these empower election officials to know what works. So how do we work effectively with election officials? I can give you some best practices drawing from my own experience, um, and I, I hope to help you avoid some of the mistakes that I, I know I've made over the years. Um, the first of these is to understand the situation that the election official is facing. You should start from the perspective that both of you want every eligible voter in the state, county, or town to be voting. That should be your starting place with shared values. The second is to take the time to educate yourself. Understand the state's election laws and rules and the facts. That'll inform your understanding of the problem and your ability to identify solutions. It will also make you a credible partner with an election, to an elections official who, at the end of the day, has a lot of experience and a lot of authority. 
The third is to make fact-based arguments. If you're concerned about long lines at a polling place, show the, the Caltech MIT tools that I mentioned a moment ago to your local election officials so that they can understand, for example, how adding or subtracting voting machines is going to impact wait time at, at their polling locations. It's very easy to get fired up and emotional when we're talking about the right to vote, and that is ultimately a good thing but it's always very important to come back to the facts in your advocacy. You also wanna bring solutions that are implementable, that are practical and feasible, given the time and the money that's available. Resource constraints are real, and you need to realize that if you've discovered a problem in October before an election, you are probably not gonna be able to solve it by overhauling the way that the county votes. But you also want to be creative in your problem solving. It's a balance, right, that you want to strike. You should not ever be afraid to ask yourself, what would we do if we had limitless time and money? Look to other states and counties for solutions. They may apply in your state, even though it's a different state or a different county. You know, take a step back. And if you can't, you know, think about different ways to get to the outcome that you want. You know, if you can't get a polling place on your college campus, you know, ask the city to offer free bus rides to student voters. If voters need proof of residency, uh, ask county officials to accept um, electronic utility bills shown on smartphones so that voters don't have to bring a paper copy of their bill. There are many paths to a successful outcome, and it's helpful to keep that in mind. Finally, for dues, I would say do identify allies who can carry your message forward. The Association of Statewide Election Officials, community leaders, religious leaders, elected officials, student groups, and even the press can support your advocacy. Be thoughtful about how you deploy these partnerships. Who is going to be the best messenger for a particular cause? That's something you always want to ask yourself. As for don'ts, I would say the first is to not make assumptions. Uh, you can't know what's motivating an election official, and you should try to understand their perspective and to ask them so you can understand where they're coming from. You also don't want to come just with problems, but without real solutions. I would, I would say that you should not overreact. Um, calling the local press probably is not um, the first step you want to take towards resolving a problem. Um, again, you know, these are emotional issues. Um, but, but be thoughtful about um, the first step you want to take towards a resolution. At the same time, though, I would say you don't want to underreact. Um, community pressure, whether it's the press or local leaders, can be an important, important mechanism for making change. Use publicity judiciously, I would say, uh, but know when it's time to engage the, the broader community. And my final, um, my final don't is... To not, forget, um, to not forget your values. Uh, your job is to help voters cast a ballot that's going to count. And these are tough issues and I would say very tough times. And if you let yourself be guided by what is going to keep voters voting, uh, you, will, you, will not, you will not go wrong. And with that, I will turn it back over to our moderators. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Hannah, and thanks to all of our speakers. Jen, do you have questions for us? Hi, everybody. This is Akini Freechild with Public Citizen. I have a couple questions that I've, we've gotten a lot of great questions for folk from different folks, and I want to try to distill them down into three because we're running low on time. And thanks, Jen, for, for delegating this role. Um, so before we get to the questions, just really quickly, if you haven't gone to secureourvote.us, um, that is our shared campaign site across Common Cause, Public Citizen, Rock the Vote, and several other groups working to help secure our elections and also build great relationships with election administrators to make sure that everybody has the right to vote. Um, so I'll get into the questions as we don't have a ton of time. We're actually a little bit over here. Um, the first question that we got from a couple different folks is what are the groups on this call doing to address the Pence Kobach Commission that's been attacking people's right to vote and trying to potentially um, purge the voter rolls? I think that could go to Rock the Vote, Common Cause, Access Democracy. 
Um, well, this this is Amber. I I can um, sort of talk a little bit about the direct impact on voters and and what we've done even even recently to reach out to those that withdrew, if that's helpful. Please go ahead. Okay. Um, well, Denver, um, we we definitely had a, an impact from that commission. It was it was decently significant. Um, part of the reason that I think we had a little bit more of an impact than other states was there's sort of a communication um, um, sort of issue about uh, a few things that that were sort of came from the Secretary of State's office. Um, so there was a suggestion made that kind of hit the press that withdrawing people's registrations would be a good solution to um, the request for, for data. And so we saw a significant number of people, I think over 6,000 across the state, withdraw. And for Denver, that was like, that was over a 2,000% increase um, in withdrawals than what we had seen in a previous week or even a previous year at the same time. So it was, it was significant. We received a lot of feedback from voters about their concerns, um, most of which was sort of circled around their privacy and, you know, their kind of protection of, of not only their rights to vote, but also their, their information. Um, so we actually monitored that and did some outreach right after it happened. And then recently, because we have a November 7th election, we actually just sent a letter about a week ago to those voters who had not withdrawn yet. And we've received, um, I think we were at about 25% of them back in five days of new, like them re-registering. So our letter I think was a good communication. We were able to remind people there was an upcoming election um, and get them back re-registered. And so we've been getting those, we've been getting thank you notes about kind of how that was handled. Um, and, and I think, you know, to me, and now as I've seen this, as I've talked to voters, as we've received information, um, I think that uh, their experience and their feelings about it is the most important um, piece of this discussion. That's great. Thanks so much. Does anyone else want to quickly chime in on that question? Um, this is Jen. I can just underscore that it's certainly something that we're paying very close attention to. Um, the most recent meeting that we had heard rumors about was that there was under consideration something about whether or not it had been a good idea if 18 year olds were really actually given the right to vote and whether that was a good idea. We didn't see that pan out. But we also did release a statement in advance of the meeting to make sure that if it was brought up that it was certainly mentioned that it was a great idea, obviously. So it's something that we're watching closely. I know a number, pretty much everybody that's involved in the voting rights space is paying attention to make sure that everybody continues to have access to democracy. Thank you. All right, I have a combined question from a couple of different folks for Tom Hicks and anybody else who wants to field it. Um, are there any federal standards for voting machines? <laughs> Are machines different across counties and states? And does the EAC have um, auditing practice standards that are, that are federal or recommendations? Yes, so um, 47 out of 50 states use some form of our system guidance and they're voluntary so states can use them or they can't use them it's not it's um uh, we are in the process right now of rewriting our standards so um as barbara was saying she's a member of our our, our board of uh, advisors and they will get those uh, <coughs> to uh, vote on those in January at our annual board meetings. Um, and then there will be a 90 day period to vote on that in the, um, towards the middle of next year. Uh, one of the things I wanted to you know, launch on uh, from the previous question is that uh, there's been a lot of confusion with the COBOC Commission and the EAC. And I wanna make sure that there's still a lot of talk of eliminating the Election Assistance Commission from members in Congress. Um, 
and others, but I want to make sure that folks know that we are not that commission. Um, there's one member on our commission who's a member on that commission, but we do not share office space or ideas or anything of this sort. So um, that being said, I'll uh, see if anyone else wants to answer the question you posed. I'd like to answer, can you hear me? Yes, mm -hmm. oh, okay, good. So um, the, as, as Tom said, the, the standards are being rewritten and they're going to be significantly improved from what they were. Uh, the problem is that um, a lot of the machines that are still being voted on in elections uh, well, in 2016 and 2017, and if we're not careful, 2018, were uh, certified to old standards, which really were totally inadequate. That's how it's the case that in Georgia, the Diebold touchscreen voting machines, as I said, that were used for the CD6 election that are going to be used in 2018 if we don't get rid of them and replace them with paper ballots are, I mean, there have been study after study of those machines that show them to be fundamentally insecure. So I just wanted to say that uh, first of all, if you want to find out what machines are in use, please go to vo verifiedvoting.org and click on the verifier. We have all that information. But also, in terms of what people can do, we need people to get involved at the state and local level, especially if you are voting on insecure voting technology or if you don't have good auditing, post-election post ballot audits. You need to get involved, encourage your local election officials to, to the extent possible to replace insecure voting machines. You may have to get involved at the state level to try to find funding because as Tom, I'm sure will, you know, will agree with me, funding is always a problem. So a lot of local election officials are well aware of how insecure their voting machines are and they can't get funding to replace them. So this is really an area where we need to get people seriously involved with their governments. Thanks. And I just wanted to jump in briefly, uh, since we don't have a lot of time to talk, to go back to the last question, if folks want to learn more about the Commission Common Cause, um, we're actually suing the Commission for violating the Privacy Act, but we also wrote a report called Flawed from the Start that goes through a lot of the issues around the Commission, and that's available on our website, commoncause.org. So anyone who wants to dig in a little bit more, that's a good resource. The COBAC Commission, let's make sure we're clear. <laughs> yes. Okay, great. Um, well, we need to wrap fairly soon. We've gotten a ton of really great questions and we'll try, if we don't get to answer them tonight, we will try our best to answer them via text um, if you've entered them on the webinar. Um, there was a really broadly applicable question that I wanna make sure we get to, which is whether you're concerned about voter access or election security, there are certainly a number of uncooperative state and local election officials and as well as some really, really wonderful ones, including Amber and, and others. Um, any advice about reaching them from any of the panelists? Yeah, hi, this is Hannah at Access Democracy. I, I would say that, you know, the place to start is um, with a conversation about to sort of suss out why you are not finding common ground. I think that is always the place to start because the answer, sort of someone's recalcitrance may seem one way to you, but they have a different perspective. You think it's about voting rights, but they're thinking about budget. And you guys are not in the same place. And so I think, what is, I always tell people, you, know, you gotta find what the golden nugget is. What is that thing that they are hanging on to? What is their fundamental concern? So start there and see if you can come to a place of agreement. And then you escalate appropriately. Um, I think that you figure out, you know, who, who in the community is going to be a strong messenger for um, the issue that you are trying to um, change. Who is the right person to talk to this election official? Um, and then think about, you know, whether community activism, maybe you want to pack the Board of Elections when they're deciding on their early vote sites, as was done very effectively in North Carolina in 2016. Maybe you want to talk to a local reporter. People are responsive to different kinds of pressures, um, but you always want to be mindful about how you're escalating and if it's going to really give you the outcome that you want. Anybody else? Yeah, I would agree with all of that. And I would just say that we've found, we've had the best experiences finding common ground when there is an ongoing dialogue. So for us, it's a lot of our work around 
election protection. When there's an election going on, when we're in constant contact, problems we see, what they're hearing, it just creates more space to say, okay, how do we solve this in the future? And you're not going to fix it the day before the election, but that might be the inspiration for legislation that makes sure that, you know, there are enough ballot boxes or enough early vote locations. So thinking through how do you take your shared experiences to find common ground? And, you know, I think Hannah really hit it. It's how do you find those pieces where you do have the same goals, even if we talk about it differently. Great. Thank you. We have one more sort of combined question from a number of people, and then I think we're going to wrap it up. Um, if you haven't signed up at secureourvote.us and you want to be tuned in to future calls, um, please do that now. Go to secureourvote.us. Um, so a couple people are wondering if there's any way we can really find out if there were hacks from the last election. Um, somebody asked specifically about uh, Mike Barb and unhack the vote hashtag. If, if uh, Barbara or anybody else finds those conclusions compelling, um, and they also wanted to clarify, Barbara, if the voluntary guidelines from the EAC are already available or if they're still um, coming out. I don't know if the drafts are. Tom, can, are the drafts publicly available? Yes, the the drafts are on our website at eac.gov. People can read them. People can read them. Right, good. So, uh, so when I when I talked about previous as I said earlier, um, a lot of machines were certified to old standards, which are far inferior to the ones that are currently being considered. And unfortunately, we can't get rid of them on the basis that they were not certified to the current standards. So that's a problem. As far as was the election actually hacked, I think the answer is we truly don't know. Um, I know some people are claiming that it was but I don't think there's any, they have evidence to prove that it was. On the other hand, there hasn't been the kind of study to check whether or not uh, there was something, there was anything untoward that happened to the actual ballots. For example, um, where there are paper ballots, where you could do um, a, a recount or even just a post-election ballot audit, in many cases that's not done. And so uh, we don't really know. There were a lot of problems that were that turned up during the recount. For example, Michigan has this crazy, crazy law that says if the initial tally that was given doesn't match the number of voters who were supposed to have voted, you cannot do a recount. You have to go with the initial tally. Now, that just doesn't make any sense at all. That's a case where you absolutely want to do a recount. And in Michigan, they do have paper ballots. So there are lots of problems with being able to do recounts. Georgia has a law. I mean, no, Pennsylvania has a law that says for each county, you need three citizens to sign an affidavit requesting a recount in that county. That essentially makes it impossible to do a statewide recount, even if they had paper ballots. So uh, there's a lot of work that needs to be done to reform our voting laws, our recount laws, our audit laws, and to replace insecure bad voting technology with secure technology that can be checked. That, that needs to be done. Great. And this is, and this is Amber. I, I guess I would just add, especially from the Colorado side of things, um, it was mentioned earlier, but we're going to be a statewide risk limiting audit state. Um, the Secretary of State's office, it's a good example of a partnership. I mean, they've, they've partnered and Amber. including counties, but yes, just a little bit louder if you can. Oh, okay. So I was just, I mean, I, I think the Colorado risk limiting audit experience that is sort of happening right now and it'll be the first state to implement it is a good example of why it's important to focus on solutions and fairness and transparency in the process because the Secretary of State's office has partnered with um, outside groups, experts in the field. They've taken feedback. The county clerks have been involved. It's sort of a good example of all of the different entities working together to come up with a solution to address auditing or fairness within the election process as well as security. So I just throw that out there because I think it's better to sort of focus on solutions to the issues, um, especially given the, the complexity of the election process itself. And that should always kind of, if everyone sort of commits to a solution-based approach, I think you get better results. I just want to second what Amber said. Uh, what Colorado is doing is very exciting. They're really taking a leadership role. They're the first in the nation, and we hope that they're incredibly successful. Uh, and, and again, 
What we really need are evidence-based elections, and that's what Colorado is going to have. That's fantastic. All right, I think if you didn't get your question answered, we'll do our best to answer it uh, via text. Thank you so much for all the questions. Um, our next call for Secure Our Vote will be on November 14th. At 8 p.m., we'll be talking to Representative Jim Langevin from Rhode Island. Rhode Island just passed risk-limiting audits, and he was involved in that fight. It's really wonderful, and now we have two states with risk-limiting audits to point to. Um, but we really are committed uh, as a coalition to making sure that everybody has their right to vote, that you as activists can build good relationships with your local election administrators, that you have these resources to make sure that um, people can access the vote by becoming poll workers yourselves um, and really just engaging in this entire process. So if you haven't signed up at secureourvote.us, please do um, check out our next call on November 14th. And uh, Jen, do you have any closing thoughts? Um, no, but I'm so grateful to all of the panelists and to my co-hosts at Public Citizen and Common Cause. Um, thank everybody for being part of this. So it was great. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks.